Hey, this is Dr. Ben White's host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me and let's jump into the podcast. Hello, Rational Wellness Podcasters. Today, we have an interview with nutritionist Risa Gru on the food frame approach to health. Risa Gru is a holistic and functional nutritionist based in New Newport Beach, California. She believes in treating the root cause of health problems, and she believes that clients that need to lose weight, if they promote their health with a functional nutrition approach, weight loss will be a side effect of wellness. Risa has written a book called Food Frame, which details her approach that utilizes six different dietary approaches, depending upon the person's symptoms and health concerns. These include paleo, keto, autoimmune paleo, vegan, low FODMAP, and low lectin. Risa, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So perhaps you can start by telling us a, a bit about your personal health journey and how you became so interested in nutrition and functional medicine. I have always been interested in nutrition from the time I was a little kid. I just remember growing up in a house where my mother was always on a diet. My grandmother was on a diet. I remember my grandma would always go. She would call it the fat farm once a year, which I later found out was Canyon Ranch Spa that she would go to for a year. <laughs> Every year. And, you know, there was always these words in my house called fattening and, oh, I can't have that. That's it's too many calories. And I was always wondering why are foods different and what, how, what makes us fat and how do we, how do we gain weight and how do we lose weight and why are people always on a diet? So I was always interested in food from a very, very early um, age. And then uh, slowly but surely, I ended up um, never had a weight problem as a kid and then um, started to develop some symptoms of a low thyroid. Uh, didn't really know what they were, just thought they were kind of normal. And um, I was able to conceive my first child without any problems at all. And then I could not conceive my second child. I was having... Uh, tough time conceiving. And then I would have several miscarriages and finally went to an infertility specialist and um, where they tested me and said, you have a thyroid problem, take this pill. And I said, oh, how long do I take the pill for? And he said, every day. And I said, no, no, no. For how long do I take the pill for? And he said, oh, for the rest of your life. And I was just astounded at that. I thought, how could I be taking a synthetic for something that my body was actually born to produce? So aren't we, shouldn't we back up and say, why is it not producing this hormone and what can we do to fix it instead that's, of, taking that's it? not a question conventional medicine usually asks. Exactly. And, but that's where the birth of it came for me. The curiosity of an innate curiosity. I'm always wondering why, why is it, do I have a deficiency in Synthroid because I have these, 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 uh, symptoms and I realized, no, I don't have a deficiency in medication. And you and have then, a deficiency in lisinopril and you have a deficiency in statins and, statins, <laughs> yep, and blood pressure medications and, and, and so on. And so on. And, yep. Yep. And Zoloft and, you know, so on and so forth. So I realized that these are just wonderful band-aids that we have in Western medicine and great for, for a momentary uh, relief, but they really shouldn't be taken long term. I have a sheets and sheets of all these side effects of all the, the, the medications that not just the effects of the body, but just what they, uh, the blocking of nutrients that, that take place when you're having these medications day in and day out. So, um, you know, I always say, you know, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to plug the hole at the top of the boat, right. And cover the water there. So how did you manage to get yourself, um, your thyroid fixed and get off of thyroid medication? So I um, did a deep dive and was on the Synthroid for a bit and um, researched. This is way back when, before a lot of internet. So I did a ton of research and um, then was later diagnosed. I did everything. I mean, I did um, herbals. I did acupuncture. I did uh, just everything I could naturally. And then um, was later diagnosed with Hashimoto's. And at that time, I, when I was told I had Hashimoto's, I did not have one direction. Nobody told me to take out gluten, soy, 
uh, dairy. Nobody gave me any dietary uh, guidance. I didn't have any medication guidance. I really didn't have any guidance, period. So I did a ton of research and I thought, why is it that I have this autoimmune disease attacking my thyroid gland? So I couldn't find at that time a checklist of everything that could be a root cause to autoimmune. So I put my I put one together after years and years of researching. I eventually um, assembled a list of root causes and put it in my book, Food Frame, because uh, I think it's really important for people to know how you get autoimmune disease and how you can treat it and um, and perhaps reverse it. Cool. Um... So um, I, I noticed you like to start some of your clients with a two week detox. Correct. Why do you do this? What is your detox program consist of? So there's a couple of reasons why I do it. The first reason is because it puts kind of bumpers on uh, on this on the situation for people, right? So they come in whether they're drinking tons of coffee with lots of uh, chemicals in their coffee, whether they're having wine or alcohol frequently, um, and they're eating bread, sugar, dairy, alcohol. They're eating, you know, sort of out of the bounds. It kind of puts bumpers on it and says, okay, here is what you can eat, and here is what you can't, and so it gives you those boundaries, which I think is really good. Instead of doing it slowly, it's just a very structured. This is what we're going to do for 14 days. The second reason. I do it. And the primary reason I do it is to clean out the liver. The liver is the key to the castle. So it really helps to, to, uh, help the liver, uh, perform more optimally and help us with all, with everything, any excess estrogens that are stored in the liver, it helps to take those out. It really balances out the blood. It opens up the pathways one and two so that we are effectively able to detoxify. If somebody has a, has a high level of homocysteine, it helps with that. It just helps stabilize things. Uh, the other reason I do it is because a lot of symptoms that people walk in my door with go away, itching skin, headaches, um, inability to sleep, uh, acne is a big one, regularity, bloating, gas, indigestion. A lot of those things will fall by the wayside in two weeks. Um, and then of course people love it because there is weight loss. Everybody does lose weight on my detox. Um, but it isn't a weight loss program. I say that all the time. It is not a weight loss program. And as you mentioned, weight loss is side effect of wellness, and we're just focusing on wellness, but I'm always curious to know how much we can get done just with food and detoxifying, which usually tends to be a lot. And the last reason I do it is because it's my data uh, gathering time. So I'm ordering blood tests, I'm ordering stool tests. And by the time they're finished with the detox, I really have a good idea. I have a roadmap now. I've got, I can see what the issues are. I know what your health status is. So at that point I can springboard from there. And so what does your detox program consist of? And what is it that you're detoxing? So I have there, my detox is 14 days. There are two collagen shakes every single day. So the protein is collagen, which is great. Uh, very little carbs, lots of good collagen, which is great. I call it grout for leaky gut. It's really helpful for hair, skin, and nails as well. Uh, joint pain, any um, inflammation. Um, and uh, it's just, it's a gut healer. And then you're eating, you know, I'm all about protein, fat, and fiber. So you're having protein, fat, and fiber in that shake twice a day. And then you're eating basically paleo food. So you're having um, animal protein, unlimited vegetables, any way you want them except for deep fried. Um, and then you're having um, uh, good fats. So eggs, nuts, seeds, and then you can have some sweet potato and yam. So you should not be hungry. It has nothing to do with starvation. I'm just trying to clear out the liver and the toxins. You know, the unfortunate statistic here is that the FDA has currently approved 86,000 chemicals for us to use. 86,000. That's the current number. And that's a new number. And it really doesn't matter who's in the White House. About 2,000 a year get approved. And most of them, which is the sad fact, are not even tested. So we have to be really diligent because we have more chemicals than any other country on the planet. And so we have to be diligent about really reducing our toxic load. So that's another thing that the detox does is it decreases your toxic load. We're eating mostly organic and non-processed foods. We take out the processed oils and um, take out a lot of the inflammatory foods. So, uh, but how does your detox program facilitate liver detox? What does it do? Exactly? In addition to the collagen, there are an antioxidants and amino acids that are designed to help and open up uh, pathways one and two for uh, efficient detoxification. Your liver numbers improve, your inflammation numbers improve. I mean, I see it all the time. And during the detox, are they eating or they're just taking the shakes? 
Yeah, no, they're eating. So it's okay. today and one meal. And if you're hungry, then eat a snack. If you're really hungry, eat two meals. I have some professional athletes I work with. Those people are having two shakes and two meals. Um, but it's, I always say eat when you're hungry, not when you're not. And it really helps you. It helps that leptin. That's that hormone that tells us that we're full and, and ghrelin that tells us we're hungry. Sometimes people come in and they're so dysregulated that they don't even really are not even functioning. We don't know if we're hungry and we're just always eating because it's either that time to eat or just because it's in front of us, or we're afraid we might get hungry. And I always say to people, it's okay. We will not die if we're hungry for an hour or three. We really won't three hours. You're good. So, um, we, I don't know what it is, but you know, when I was a kid, I remember it's like, wait till dinner time. Now it's let's eat before dinner. So you to tide you over. Well, you know, things have kind of shifted as, as they frequently do in the nutrition world. So I've been in this a long, long time. And, uh, so, you know, when I first started, uh, the thing we had to tell everybody is you have to eat breakfast because everybody would skip breakfast and they'd eat a light lunch and a big dinner. And that's why everybody was fat because they skipped breakfast. And then the key was you had to eat breakfast and you had to have a snack or meal every three hours, to keep them even blood sugar. And so the big thing, if you want to lose weight, you have to eat more because that's going to stimulate your metabolism. You have to have, uh, you have to eat within an hour of waking up and then you have to have a meal, a uh, snack in two hours. And then you have to have a meal and then you have to have another snack. And, and unless you do that, your blood sugar is going to go crazy and you're not going to lose weight. Right. And, and now we're back to skipping breakfast is good for you. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I, that's where I, my methodology comes in is it's not one size fits all. So if you have a blood sugar issue, I, and you are low blood sugar, I am not going to recommend intermittent fasting for you for sure. If you have, um, you know, conversely, if you have diabetes, blood sugar, uh, intermittent fasting would be a great thing for you to do. It would help with blood sugar regulation. I've really been enjoying this discussion, but I'd like to take a minute to tell you about a new product that I'm very excited about. I'd like to tell you about a new wearable called the Apollo. And this is a device that can be worn on the wrist or the ankle, and it uses vibrations to stimulate your parasympathetic nervous system. And this device has amazing benefits in terms of uh, getting you out of that stressed out sympathetic nervous system and stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system. It has a number of different functions, especially helping you to relax, to focus, to concentrate, to get into a deeper meditative state, even to help you sleep. And there's even a mode to help you wake up. And this all occurs through the uh, scientific use of subtle vibrations. Uh, for those of you who might be interested in getting the Apollo for yourself to help you uh, reset your nervous system, go to ApolloNeuro.com and use the um, affiliate code WHITES10. That's my last name, W-E-I-T-Z-10. And now back to the discussion. So uh, you say that weight loss is a function of wellness. But some people claim that they are fat, but healthy. What say you? <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I appreciate that point of view, but I'm all about numbers. I'm very science rooted. So I like to see facts. And um, the fact is, is that when we carry extra weight, it really is equivalent to having inflammation. So those people, I don't know how they define healthy, but for me, they're foundational issues and they come into two, two categories. One is systemic inflammation, which we know is the driver of disease. And we know now with COVID that people are, are dying from third stage inflammation, which is usually blood sugar related, right? Then we look at gut health and gut health is incredibly important. So those are the two foundational issues I look at. So that person who says I might be fat or overweight and, or obese but I'm healthy, I don't know how they define healthy. So to me, I'm looking, are your inflammation numbers low? Because that to me defines healthy. And are your um, is your gut healthy? Is it in, intact? Do you not have all these overgrowth of bacteria? Are you not dysbiotic and things like that? What are that? the most important inflammation factors you look at? 
So I look at the CRP, the C-reactive protein that is very related to cardiovascular. And so that usually is a good indication of systemic inflammation. Um, and then the other one I look at is homocysteine and homocysteine has a lot to do with methylation, but it is a major driver of inflammation. And if it gets very high, I mean, I'm talking over 12, which I see from time to time, it could lead to dementia. It could lead to um, cardiovascular disease, macular degeneration, lots of, of health issues. So again, those are the root causes. Those are the driver of disease. Right. Um, so um, of the six dietary approaches that uh, we listed, which one do you personally follow most of the time? So because I have Hashimoto's, um, I'm about 10 points away from reversing it, which I started in the thousands and now I'm like 10 points away, which is crazy. What, so what do you, what do you, when you say 10 points away, what are you talking about? So when you are officially Hashimoto's or diagnosed with autoimmune for thyroid, you're looking at, um, at uh, thyroid peroxidase antibody, TPO, and you're looking at thyroglobulin antibody. So I never register positive for thyroglobulin antibody. So I have registered for thyroid uh, peroxidase antibody. And when I was tested positive, originally diagnosed years ago, I was in the 1400s and the lab now says you should be less than 34. So I'm at 44. So I've got about 10 points to go to reverse it completely. I follow a paleo program, but when I was first diagnosed, I was on the autoimmune protocol, or I shouldn't say when I was first diagnosed, cause it really wasn't invented. Um, but I originally took out gluten, dairy, and soy because those are really the major offenders. They have what's called molecular mimicry, uh, to, um, the, to antibodies that attack the thyroid. And when you are in a state of autoimmune, those antibodies basically are what's called inflammation. You're in a systemic inflammation. Your, your, um, your TH17 gets activated. You're in a cytokine storm. Your NF kappa B is involved and you have just systemic inflammation. And in this case, in the case of Hashimoto's, you're attacking your thyroid gland. So you, the first thing you need to do with an autoimmune patient is you just um, decrease that systemic inflammation. So I have my fab five, or now it's my essential six that are um, supplements to help quell that inflammation. So I diligently take those supplements every day, day in and day out. Um, I have removed gluten, dairy, and soy from my diet completely. Um, and then I do have sheep's milk or feta very rarely, but occasionally it's a different type of casein, different type of protein that I can tolerate. And then, um, I started the um, autoimmune protocol, AIP, which is a very restrictive form of paleo. So it's paleo, but you're taking out eggs, nuts, seeds, and eggs. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, and so um, I did that for about 90 days. And then I now follow a paleo program myself. Okay. Um, so I noticed of the dietary approaches that you list, um, uh, there's, there's one popular one, in fact, including popular in the functional medicine world that you don't list here. And that's the Mediterranean diet. Why is that? Yeah. You know, I thought about that when I was putting together the book and I realized I really don't promote that diet in my office. And I don't really recommend it, even though there's tons of studies that show it's very heart healthy. And I think the reason that it's very heart healthy is it's very focused on olive oil which is really a great oil to have. It's great fat. And um, the reason I don't really stick by that is because it adds a lot of grains and legumes. And I'm just, uh, I'm a former vegetarian or vegan myself. And I noticed that when I was vegan, I ate a lot of beans and a lot of uh, grains, quinoa, gluten-free grains, not a ton of rice, but a little bit of quinoa and millet and um, occasionally amaranth. But uh, I really, I sustain myself on that because you need to get your protein from a source. So it, it's going to come in the form of nuts, beans, or seeds and grains. And so I noticed every time I did my blood work, my blood sugars were escalating. And I'm thinking, how is, could this be? I'm not eating any sugar at all. And I was eating gluten-free bread and all my products were gluten-free. I wasn't having any dairy and I wasn't eating any sugar. I really was eating very little berries, but I was having berries. And, um, I, when I, my hemoglobin A1C got to 5.6, which, um, just for reference range, 5.7 is pre-diabetic. I said, that's it. This is not working for me. And I stopped that diet 
and I went completely paleo and I took out all the legumes and grains that are carbohydrates at the end of the day. They're filled with great properties of great fiber, polyphenols. Um, all those things are really, really great. But at the end of the day, they're carbohydrates. And that just doesn't work. And in my opinion, for everyone. Some people can, if you're an elite athlete, I'm going to say you probably need more carbohydrates, but most of us are not elite athletes, me included, even though I work out all the time, I'm not an elite athlete. So I don't need that many carbohydrates. And, um, so I do recommend it for some people, some of the time, but I don't think that there's a major population that thrives on a Mediterranean diet. I can agree to disagree on that. <laughs> but um, your thoughts on that? Uh, you know, I I do think that a, a low glycemic version of the Mediterranean diet can be really good. Okay. Um, and I think something like autoimmune paleo is a really difficult diet to stay on for a long time. It's very, sure. very restrictive. And, and, you know, it depends on the person, like you're talking about athletes, like somebody like myself, even though I'm 63 years old and, you know, I'm working in an office still, I'm getting about 20,000 steps a day. And I, if I don't consume 3,500 calories a day, I'm going to lose weight and I'm not trying to lose weight. So it's really hard for me if I don't have some legumes or, you know, healthy grains in my diet. And, you know, I avoid gluten like you do and dairy, but, um, uh, I do find that, um, judicious use of properly cooked and, and prepared grains and legumes and sweet potatoes is necessary for me to get the calories I need to make you know, my body. And I right. fully agree. I fully agree that if you're having 20,000 steps a day regularly, you need more carbohydrates for sure. Especially if you don't want to have weight loss. So, and I, and, and let me just clarify, I'm not against legumes, especially if they're sprouted or they're, um, they're soaked, soaked overnight. Yeah. Exactly. And certain grains like quinoa, which actually isn't a grain, it's a seed, but millet, right. quinoa, amaranth. So I'm totally good with that in small doses. So I have people who just say, don't, please don't take my hummus away. Well, fine. Have some hummus. You're not having a container of hummus every day. Right. If you want some hummus and vegetables, have it, you know, like right. just watch your portions and, right. and you should be fine, but there's tons right. of benefits in those legumes. Um, but not somebody with, with SIBO or with IBS, right? That person, I'm not going to tell you have some legumes. Right. Because they, they, they're high in FODMAPs and, and, um, and I noticed you have the low lectin diet, which I guess is the, um, um, <clears throat> so why, why do you have the low lectin diet in there? So low lectin, I guess we could call it the Dr. Gundry diet. Right? Dr. Gundry diet. Yes. He really, um, highlighted, uh, the dangers of lectins and for your listeners who don't know, lectins are basically fallen under the category of anti-nutrients. And they basically are what I call a hard candy shell around the brand or the seed of, or the germ of a, of a plant. Cause we all have our way of protecting ourselves. Humans, if we're in danger, we can flee by kick, scream, yell, and call 911. Plants don't have that ability, right? So they have this protective coating on them that says, if you try to eat me or destroy me, I'm going to do my best to sustain myself and procreate because those are our two main goals as living organisms. And so they're very hard to digest for people. So not everybody, those people who have SIBO and IBS and, and some people have autoimmune, they're going to have a difficult time breaking down those lectins, especially if you're not having any digestive enzymes, you're not taking any digestive enzymes, or you're not producing digestive enzymes, you are going to have a horrible time. And those are the people who come in and saying, I had, you know, three garbanzo beans and I was bloated all night or, you know, I had hummus and I just wanted to die. My, my belly was like a balloon that needed to be popped. Those people cannot break it down. So, um, Low lectin is great for, I think for, it's an anti-inflammatory diet. It's another anti-inflammatory diet, and it's really good for people with autoimmune. So it's very similar to, um, paleo or AIP, but they're different. It's really more centered around lectins. And some people do really well with a low lectin diet. Yeah. It's, it's pretty restrictive because uh, I mean, there are so many vegetables that contain lectins, including cucumbers and tomatoes and squash. And I mean, it's very, very restrictive. It is very restrictive. And again, that's why not everybody does well with it. Um, but some people do. 
Now, on a practical level, as a dietitian, you put somebody on a low FODMAP diet or a you know, uh, autoimmune paleo diet. How do you, um, what, what kind of guidance do you give them? Do you simply say, here's a list of foods not to eat. Here's the foods you can eat. Or, you know, how, how do you make this work? Cause I've noticed some patients need more hand holding. And, um, do you, do you have some way of, of giving them more detailed guidance in your practice? Sure. So in my practice, I test everybody because what I do basically like, you know, I watch a movie on HBO and then it tells me all these other movies I might be interested in. I listen to a song on Spotify and it tells me all these other songs that I would be interested in. Right. We don't have anything to tell us what kind of food that we are customized to eat. Right. So I've created that because it's crazy that in this day and age, we're not customizing our food to our health status. So right. the first thing we have to do is find out our health status. So if I'm working with you in my office or, you know, we're working through Zoom, I'm going to find out because I'm ordering your blood test and your stool test. So I'll find out what your, what, what your landscape. What, you know, uh, what, what sort of blood tests and stool tests are you going to order? So I order a comprehensive um, bio screen and that tells me all 10 markers of your thyroid, not just the two or the one that your doctor orders, but all 10. And it tells me all four markers of your blood sugar. So I'm looking for insulin resistance. I'm looking for prediabetes. And then it tells me inflammation markers. And then it gives me a breakdown of your white blood cells. And it gives me a ton of information, iron, which is a big factor. Um, and um, all your liver enzymes, it gives me a very full picture. And I look for viral patterns. I look for bacterial patterns. And then I order a stool test. And that tells me about 84 pathogens, fungus, yeast, worms, parasites, tells me how much digestive enzyme, pancreatic enzymes you're producing, tells me how you do with fat malabsorption. If you have a fat malabsorption issue, tells me about your immunity because so much of our immunity is produced in our gut. Tells me um, where it, a lot of people come to me with a lot of uh, sex hormone imbalance. And that gives me a good indication of uh, beta glucuronidase. If you, if that is high, then that will likely be the factor that is um, dysregulating hormones. So and then I look for leaky gut and um, inflammation in your gut. So I can really see what's going on. I can find out if there's SIBO, bacteria, all that stuff. And so then I'm educated. I've got my data. I can say, this is what your landscape looks like. And this is the, the eating lifestyle that best suits what your health status is. If I'm not working with you in my office or via Zoom, and you just go on my website, you're going to take the food frame quiz. And it really is an expeditious way to pretty much figure out what eating type is best for you. And then you go from there. But I also have a course coming out on um, uh, thyroid health so that people can learn how to read their thyroid labs and ask their doctor what to test for and find out if they do have a thyroid issue or if their, or if their thyroid medication isn't working. So we just need to educate people on how to do this for themselves. Okay. So, but practically, let's say you select... Uh, you know, the um, low FAVMAP diet. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you get them to follow it? Right. What? So I give them a handout and I give them all the foods to enjoy and I give them a list of foods to avoid. And then um, I usually work with these people. So I give them a food log and they're kind of judging how they're doing in a low FODMAP case. I would say, let's, you know, give me evaluation of how your uh, bloating is or your constipation, your chronic diarrhea. Right. So I have some assessment way of, you know, assessing. So they write down what they're eating and then they write down how they're feeling and they're Exactly. And we're starting to relate that, oh, if I have a quarter of an avocado, I'm good. But if I have more than a quarter, if I have a half an avocado, I have bloating or I have diarrhea, whatever it is. And so um, we start to make those correlations of what food is affecting them. And then I work with people. So I have that um, ability to say, OK, and then usually a lot of those lifestyles that are on there, like low FODMAP and AIP, those are a temporary elimination diet. So that's 30 to 90 days. Once you're done with that, then I say, okay, let's look at the landscape and see where do you go from here? So an AIP, they would typically either go to AIP, I'm sorry, they would go to paleo. So they're opening up a few more things or reintroducing things, or they would go low lectin, um, but usually they go paleo. And then um, with somebody with SIBO or um, IBS, 
I would recheck their stool test to see if their inflammation is gone. We'll know because their symptoms will have gone away. And then we treat that whatever is in there and we look at the root cause and address it. I'd like to interrupt this fascinating discussion we're having for another few minutes to tell you about another really exciting product that has changed my life and the life of my family, especially as it pertains to getting good quality sleep. It's something called the Chili Pad, C-H-I-L-I-P-A-D. It can be found at the website, chilisleep.com, which is C-H-I-L-I, S-L-E-E-P.com. And so this product involves a water-cooled mattress pad that goes underneath your sheets and helps you maintain a constant temperature at night. If you've ever gotten woken up because the temperature has uh, changed, typically goes uh, gets warmer, um, this product will maintain your body at a very even temperature, and it tends to promote uninterrupted quality um, deep and REM sleep, which is super important for healing and for overall health. And if you you go to chillysleep.com and you use the affiliate code WHITES20, that's my last name, W-E-I-T-Z, 20, you'll get 20% off a chili pad. So check it out. And let's get back to this discussion. So once they've been on one of these specialized diets for a period of time, do you try to introduce all the foods or do you keep certain foods out permanently? You know, I, there's, I always like to have diversity in the microbiome, right? So we now are knowing about short chain fatty acids, which is really the food for the colon, the, the, the end of the line. Right. right. The and I have a product. and a propionate and a- Exactly. Exactly. And I have what's called post biomax, which is a postbiotic. They're now called postbiotics, like not a prebiotic, not a probiotic, but a post. Um, and it is those butyrates and all those things that pr- pr- uh, pr- creates the diversity of the microbiome. So I always want to do things through food. And if you don't have to take a pill, I'm always saying, let's do it through food. But it's as if I were to say to you, I want you to go into the market and go into the produce section and buy every single food in there that you have no idea what it is. You don't know what country it comes from. You've never had it before. Put it all in your basket, bring it home, put it in the blender, whip it up and drink that. That's going to create the diversity of the microbiome. But unfortunately, we all eat about the same 20, 40 foods day in and day out in different forms or shapes. And so we don't get that diversity of the microbiome. So um, especially if you're on a restricted diet, I always want to say bring in some more colors for sure and more things. So it depends on what you are. So if you're autoimmune, you know, I'm not going to say to you, you should have some gluten. Um, that wouldn't be good for you. But if I've tested you and I've looked at your, um, your, your anti-gliadin on my stool test and I say, you really don't show up high for gluten, uh, then I would say to you, once we take care of the autoimmune, you can start bringing in gluten in every now and then. Or if you wanted to have gluten, if you're going to Italy, I'm going to say, have fun here, take some gluten flam with you so you can um, mitigate the, the effects of that gluten. And it's, it's not going to cause major havoc for you. Now, if you're celiac, I'm not going to say that to you. You're not going to have gluten. Um, but I try not to say ever, never, forever. But um, some cases, that is the case. Um, and, you know, every now and then, a cheese might be okay with you. But I'd have to know what your specific uh, circumstances and your health status is. You say that saturated fats are among the healthiest fats but don't saturated fats promote atherosclerosis and heart disease? Certain ones do. Yes, absolutely. If they're from the wrong sources, for sure. So saturated fats and coconut oil or coconut products, as we know, are good for you. We know that they're antimicrobial. They've got um, uh, lauric acid, uh, caprylic acid, really good for gut, really good for skin. It it is controversial, but yes, I I think for a lot of people, they probably are. Yes, Now, would I tell you to have the saturated fat in Twinkies? No, I wouldn't. Those are the ones that are going to cause you some issues, right? The Twinkie fats. Yeah, Twinkie fats are probably not really recommended. (laughs) At least I don't recommend them. But if you think about it logically, I mean, think about it. I say to every patient I work with, I want you to imagine that your body is just like a sneaker factory. You've got all the equipment to make sneakers. 
I know if I give you some leather, some rubber, some canvas, we're going to get a sneaker at the end, right? May change in shape or size or color, but it's going to be a sneaker. And if I say, let's put some cell phone parts in your sneaker factory, what would you say? Right? Hopefully you would say no, because if we did that, what would happen to our machinery? It would break. So I use that silly little example because it's a great visual. If you think about the Nike factory, it's not the same as the iPhone factory, right? Fully different equipment, fully different parts. And so what I'm, I use that example for, because whoever created us, whatever that was, all of a sudden there were these things crawling on the ground and spreading from the earth that we could eat. And again, sustain ourselves and procreate our two main goals as living organisms. So I'm trying to take out the cell phone parts. Twinkies were not on the planet when we were created. Pop-Tarts, Big Macs, Doritos, I mean, you name it. Anything that really has a label on it is not really food from the farm. So if we eat food from the farm mostly, then we're in pretty good shape. So if we think about it that way, all the fats that came from the farm, we're in good shape with. Those were what we're meant to eat. Not a lot. We don't want to have you know, our plate shouldn't be this much animal protein and this much vegetables. We should have 60 to 70% of our plate living foods, whether they're cooked or not, it doesn't matter, but foods from the ground and then some protein, because we all need protein. And then we um, have some sweet potato yams or some carbohydrates, right? That are, that are good for us. We can't forget about the good fats because we need good fat. Why is sugar so bad? Why is sugar so, how much time do we have? <laughs> So sugar is the devil. Uh, we really don't glean any nutrients from sugar, unfortunately. And uh, we like sugar. Everybody's addicted to sugar. Um, and it makes us feel good, but it uh, immediately, but it doesn't do well for us. And I'll just give you a few of my things on my list. Sugar makes us fat. Why does it make us fat? Because it makes the pancreas pump out some insulin and it converts it into glycogen. And then we send it to every cell in the body and we use that for energy, right? It gets into there if, you're, if your receptors are open and it goes into the mitochondria and that's our energy factories, right? We're making energy. But any excess we have, if we can't fit it into the cell, it just parks it in storage, right? We just keep putting it in the storage unit. And if your receptors on your cells are closed, that's insulin resistance, we're going to park it into fat tissues and fat cells. So that's number one. And we know that fat creates inflammation, which is the driver of disease. Second thing is um, it causes fatty liver. It will really congest our liver, our gallbladder. It doesn't help us there. Um, it feeds cancer cells, right? It's the, the, the nutrition for cancer cells to replicate. So yeah. anybody with cancer should not be having any kind of sugar at all. Yeah, we had Thomas Seafried on the podcast. Awesome. Yeah. We a lot about that. I bet yep. it eats up white blood cells. Our white blood cells are our immune um, powerhouse. They are our protectors. So even one tablespoon of sugar, table sugar can affect our, our immune system by 50% in within one hour. So I don't know about you, but I'm going out in this world, especially with COVID with all my army with me. I'm not putting anybody on vacation. Everybody's with me. I need as many troops as I can possibly have. Um, another reason why we don't like uh, white or sugar at all is, you know, it causes fatigue. We spike and then we drop. We spike and then we drop. So, you know, again, I want my A game. We can drink sugar, right? Alcohol, wine, especially is a great resource of drinking sugar and it ruins our sleep. So if you're waking up between three and four 30 in the middle of the night, you're most likely having sugar plummeting and you probably have some blood sugar issues. So it provides brain fog and fatigue and, um, gosh, I, you know, I could keep going, but it's not good for our skin. We get acne from sugar. So, you know, it's just, it's really, it, that we don't glean any nutrition from it. So, right. you know, and I talk a lot about eating for survival and eating for sport. And, you know, I, I just want to be very realistic. It's best that we eat for survival, but there's always going to be sport eating. Even, even me, I have, I have to have my gluten-free pizza every now and then I don't have it frequently, but I like it. And I want chips and salsa. Now they're Siete chips or cassava flour. And now I'm making my own salsa and I'm making my own um, guacamole. But every now and then I would like to have some of that. So we do. So what's, what's your favorite meal? Um, 
I love, I'm really, I have a few favorite meals, but I am, you know, I'm a big, huge fan of salads. I love a really good salad with some good fats, good animal protein. Um, I've been making recently, I'm a little obsessed with this because it's like literally in 10 minutes, you can just whip this up. I do sauteed veggies with mushrooms and onions and kale and um, bok choy or whatever greens I have or broccoli. And then I throw in some chicken or some fish. And then I love miracle noodles, konjac noodles. They don't have any carbohydrates in them. There's really nothing in them except for just a hair of fiber. And then I put coconut aminos. I have a sesame ginger recipe on my website that I basically do with a coconut aminos, which is a soy sauce substitute, almond butter, fresh ginger, and um, sesame oil. And it is so good. And I sprinkle black and white sesame seeds at the end, and it's packed with protein, fat, and fiber. And even my 20 year old son who, um, he loves it. So it's good. There you go. I love that. I do a lot of cauliflower rice with, um, coconut curry. I like that a lot too. Right. The cauliflower rice. Yeah. Easy. Really easy. Yeah. You basically cook it like rice. Exactly. Just heat it up and make a stir fry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Protein, fat and fiber. And I'm all over that. Good. Um, so, um, any, any final thoughts you want to leave us with, uh, did you want to maybe give us a case history maybe of, of somebody that you worked with? Sure. I have a great, um, a great story that, uh, came in this morning. Uh, she was my first client this morning and I've worked with her for a few years and I, she's very shy and private. Um, but I said to her, I wish I could showcase your family because she's married to a surgeon and, uh, she came to me a few years ago and she was exhausted. She napped every day. She had this constant congestion and she went to the doctor and her, you know, husband's friends and they were giving her steroids and she just wasn't feeling good. Her stomach didn't work. Um, and I did the detox with her and then we found out she had Hashimoto's and she had a very, very high levels of ferritin. So she was storing a lot of iron and um, she didn't have hemochromatosis, but it was a, a, an acute phase reactant to inflammation. What were her ferritin levels? They were 600 something. Okay. So we like them about a hundred and women usually fall between 40 and 70. So she was right. 565, something like that. Right. Um, 600, somewhere around there. And, um, she was pre-diabetic. We just found out all these things that was going on and we took her off gluten, dairy, sugar. We detoxed her. I think I detoxed her for about a month. Um, in just less than a year, she lost 72 pounds with me. Every single solitary symptom was gone. Her husband ended up coming in. And the great story about him is that, you know, he's an MD. So he, um, he didn't realize any of this. He wasn't aware of anything with food and he had a garden in his house and he started planting and he came in after working with me for 12 weeks. I ordered all his lab work for him because he couldn't do it at his hospital. And he also had some prediabetes and his iron levels were really high too, but he, um, he came in after 12 weeks and he said, I have to tell you something. I said, what is it? And he said, that he had been wearing a hearing aid for the last two years, which I was unaware of. And he said he went to the audiologist in his hospital and the, the audiologist said to him, I don't know what you've been doing, but you do not need a hearing aid anymore. So I was stunned because I haven't seen that. I've seen a lot of miracles in my office, but not that. And I said, what do you think it is? And I had my idea, but he said exactly what I thought, that it was systemic inflammation because all of his inflammatory numbers were really high. And so they brought in their two daughters who just suffered from severe fatigue, two teenage daughters. Uh, They had a lot on their plate with school and activities and things, but it turned out they both had a pretty high case of Epstein-Barr virus. We treated that and they have been thriving ever since. Um, so that, uh, the, the woman came into my office a few months ago back in, she's been doing great and had a full body rash and went to the doctor and they wanted to put her on all these steroid creams and everything. And so I said, well, let's do a stool test. And we did. And sure enough, she had, um, a pretty good case of, uh, geotrichum, um, which is a type of fungus and we treated it and, um, we did a food allergy test as well. Her eosinophils were elevated. So, um, we did a food allergy test. She's been so diligent. She came in this morning. She goes, please tell me I can eat more food. Cause she's really restrictive. So it's been more than 30 days. So we started just adding it back today. So we'll see how she's doing. Rash is hundred percent gone. Everything. How did, is you, how did you treat the fungus? 
Um, I have what I call natural antibiotics that I use. Um, and, you know, it consists of oregano oil and all of uh, garlic oil and a myriad of all natural herbs that I treat. Um, you know, unfortunately, it's not a 10 day script. It's a little bit longer, but it works and it's clearly working. Which for ones her. did you use for her? Did you use combination products or use several individual products? There is a packet that I use from Apex Energetics that okay. um, use that I use to treat this pretty much with almost everybody I work with. And it kills, it just kills bacteria and yeast and um, fungus and, and uh, H pylori, things like that. So I'm always looking at the underlying cause we found it. And she came in today and she said, the rash is fully gone. She feels amazing. And um, now we're going to open up the gates so she can eat real, you know, all these other foods again. And so you use this apex product. What's it called? It's called GI synergy. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I tested her zonulin also, and she had leaky gut. So I've given her my uh, gut reboot, which is really, really good. I give it to everybody with leaky gut, anybody with autoimmunity. I do it every day in my shake and it has um, L-glutamine and slippery elm, marshmallow root, uh, zinc carnosine, everything to heal the gut. Kind of so. like a GI revive type of product. Exactly. Very similar. Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Very good. So how can uh, listeners and viewers get a hold of you, find out about more about you if they want to work with you? Yeah. So my website is Risa Gru Nutrition. It's R-I-S-A. My last name is G-R-O-U-X Nutrition. And I work with people all over the world, um, Instagram, Pinterest, and um, TikTok even. I have all those things at Risa Gru Nutrition. And then look for my um, thyroid, Achieving uh, Optimal Thyroid Wellness is launching March 11th and um, only open for a short period of time. But we it's a deep, deep dive into thyroid. And then Food Frame, we actually sold out our first run, but it should be back up on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and our website as well um, any day. So food frame, and it explains everything that we really talked about in great detail. Cool. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. And I hope everybody learned something. I'm sure we did. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for making it all the way through this episode of the rational wellness podcast. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please go to Apple podcasts and give us a five-star ratings and review. That way more people will be able to find this Rational Wellness Podcast when they're searching for health podcasts. And I wanted to let everybody know that I do now have a few openings for new nutritional consultations for patients um, at my Santa Monica White Sports Chiropractic and Nutrition Clinic. So if you're interested, please call my office, 310-395-3111 and sign up for one of the few remaining slots for a comprehensive nutritional consultation with Dr. Ben Weitz. Thank you and see you next week.